Our next um, oral presentation is from um, Daniel Vale, an MD candidate on the relationship between child mortality and distribution of wealth in lower and middle income countries between 1990 and 2015. Daniel. Thanks for having me. Um, so today I'll be talking about the relationship between health and wealth in a, in a DHS data set, basically. Um, so believe it or not, the idea that health and wealth might be connected is not a new idea. Uh, it's been studied pretty extensively at both the national level and the individual household level. Um, as an example of a, a national level study that looks at that relationship on this slide, I've plotted the, the Preston curve, which just plots um, life expectancy for countries at a certain moment in time with their GDP. And it shows that there's a pretty, pretty tight association between what we'd expect uh, to see as far as like wealthier countries having higher life expectancy. Whether or not that that relationship persists in a longitudinal data set is uh, under more, more dispute because people have certainly found situations where they'll follow a country longitudinally and see that uh, you have instances of increasing life expectancy even in cases of uh, declining or even decreasing GDP growth. Um, Similarly, lots of people have looked at the relationship between an individual's wealth and their expected health, including in DHS data sets. Uh, so I bet practically every national level DHS study includes a, uh, a measure of an individual's wealth. And typically, we, in these countries, we expect people in the higher income brackets to have higher life expectancies. Um, so what I'm trying to look at in this study in particular is uh, including many measures of health, both at the national and the individual level, and also a picture of the the wealth and the distribution of wealth in the communities that households exist in, and the impact of that on child mortality in particular, so uh, the mortality of children before the age of five. A um, little background on the data I'm using. So I'm using DHS data. DHS is Demographic and Health Surveys, and those are collected by USAID. They've been doing that for a long time. Um, there are extensive household surveys, and in different countries they cover different things, but the commonality between them is that they always cover uh, maternal and child health extensively. So they'll interview a, a woman in a household and ask about her entire birth history, and in particular the, the outcomes of each of those births. So whether or not there's a live birth, whether or not the, the child born in that birth survived to five years old, et cetera. Um, so this map shows every country that a DHS survey has been, has been done in. What I did was I limited my data set to um, all births that occurred between 1990 and 2015. So I pulled every country that had a DHS survey between 1990 and 2015, and then I included all women who had given birth in that time period, and then I turned that into a births level data set. Uh, so the, the rows in my data set are births, and we follow those over time. Um, so this covers over it covers 63 countries. Uh, that's over 70,000 villages, which if you use DHS data, really what that is is a DHS cluster. Um, over a million households, 1.2 million women, and altogether it's, uh, it covers over 4 million births. Um, so if I'm going to look at the relationship between wealth and child mortality, I need to define what wealth means. Um, and in this case, there are a bunch of measures I want to construct. So the first one is I need to be able to uh, define a household's rel wealth relative to other peers in the country. And this is commonly done in DHS data. And the way it's typically done um, is with uh, an asset index. So if you're in a context where um, there's not a lot of cash being exchanged to measure wealth or where people don't have salaries, uh, how do you define what wealth is? And um, usually what you do is the DHS asks a whole host of questions on like durable goods in the household, uh, what material is your roof made of, how many rooms are there in your house, do you have electricity, where do you get your water from, things like that. Uh, and then people collapse that down into a single variable um, using like a principal components analysis or a factor analysis. And that's very useful for comparing the wealth of a household to peers in the same country. Um, What's harder is to compare peers across countries because the exact questions that the DHS asks on the asset index are not perfectly consistent across countries. Um, so what I need to be able to do in, in this project is not only to compare households, uh, their wealth to their neighbors, but also to compare a household in Chad in 1993 to a household in Bangladesh in 1998 and say which one of these is wealthier. Um, so to do that, I restrict the asset index to all assets that are common to every single country and do a separate factor analysis. Um, the helpful thing about creating that variable, which we're calling absolute wealth in this case, is that you can also measure the distribution of it at a national and subnational level. So uh, I take all the households in the data set and I look at their absolute wealth as measured by that asset index at the national level. 
and then measure the distribution or the dispersion of that asset index. And you do that by taking the variance of the, the asset index and dividing it by the mean so that we have this mean adjusted measure of how this wealth is distributed within the country. So this is like a very rough measure of um, inequality. And you might ask, why not just use a Gini coefficient? Because those are published for all countries and they're actually more detailed. The advantage of this is it's being measured in the year that the survey was done. And more importantly, it's available subnationally. So I can tell you about wealth inequality at the village level and not just at the country level. Um, so after I've constructed these measures of absolute and relative wealth, the first thing I want to do is just say, what's the naive, unadjusted association between these and child mortality? Uh, and sort of unsurprisingly, we see this um, declining relationship where you get increased wealth measured either in relative terms or in absolute terms is associated with lower child mortality. Probably unsurprisingly, these variables are likely to be correlated with each other too. Um, and so uh, the next question is how much of this is driven by absolute wealth rather than relative wealth. And so what I do is um, I take the initial relationship. So this is relative wealth broken into thirds, so broken into tertiles for every country in the, in the data set. Uh, and under five mortality is the y-axis. And so we see that relatively wealthier households have less child mortality. But then I stratify that by absolute wealth. So the graphs on the right side of the screen are the, the wealthiest third of households in the world in absolute terms, and then the middle and then the poorest third of households over this entire time period. And the relationship between relative wealth and mortality kind of disappears when you do that. And again, these are not fully adjusted models, but it's just sort of a naive uh, association. And it suggests that perhaps in this data set, absolute wealth is the larger driver of the relationship between wealth and health. What I'm more interested in, though, rather than just the absolute levels of wealth, is how distribution of wealth within countries and communities is associated with health. Um, so I take this, my, my measure of dispersion of wealth, and this is a, a map I made of the distribution of wealth or wealth inequality in all the countries in my data set. So red is higher inequality. Um, and you can see that this behaves, it behaves well as far as it, it behaves sort of similarly to how Gini coefficients might behave. So countries that stand out in this time period with really high inequality are like Ethiopia, Namibia, Zambia. Um, and again, I'm just plotting a naive relationship here, uh, but I take that dispersion of wealth at the national level and plot it with child mortality. Each of these circles is a country. And we see this uh, potentially hazardous relationship or just a, a positive correlation between increasing inequality and increasing under five mortality, which you might expect. Lots of people have posited that uh, inequality itself, even after controlling for your wealth, might be detrimental to your health because even if your absolute level of wealth is, is not too bad, um, if you're in the lower percentiles of, uh, of wealth within your country, you're exposed to different stressors and risk factors that wealthier people are not. So this was not particularly surprising. Um, but this was more surprising. I plotted the same thing at the level of the, the DHS cluster or village, if you like. And again, this is unadjusted. Um, and you don't see the same relationship, really. So this is 70,000 villages in the data set. And you don't really see a, uh, a hazardous relationship between wealth inequality and child mortality in, in this context. Um, it just looks fairly neutral. So the next and final step in the last video I'll show you is what happens if we uh, use fully adjusted models? So these are multi-level survival models that take into account wealth in every way that I've defined it so far. So this includes wealth of the country overall, dispersion of wealth at the national level, wealth of the community that households exist in and dispersion of wealth in that community, as well as the household's wealth measured both in relative terms, so are they among the poorer third in their society, um, and in absolute terms, so are they among the upper third of, uh, of households in the entire world. Uh, and then I also include a bunch of sort of standard maternal and child health uh, indicators. So is, for a given birth, what age, uh, what maternal age did it occur at? What birth order number was it? Was it a sex of the child, um, the mother's educational level, things like that. And uh, what we find is this strongly significant um, negative correlation between uh, increasing inequality at the village level and risk of child mortality. Uh, so what this graph is, is it's um, every single birth in the data set. And so that's, uh, that's over 4 million births. And the y-axis is their, their predicted risk of mortality before age 5 um, using the fully adjusted survival model. And you can see that uh, there's this like pronounced and highly significant in every specification of the model that I've tried association that runs opposite of the national association. So this was uh, surprising to me, and I'm interested to hear people's thoughts. And again, this is not a, it's not a causal relationship, um, and definitely the conclusion is not we want more inequality at the village level, but it's an interesting and surprising finding in this data set in particular. Um, 
So I guess the, the big takeaway point I would want at this point in the analysis is to say that I certainly entered uh, this analysis with this data set expecting to find pretty consistent positive correlations between increased inequality and increased uh, child mortality at every level. And I can pretty confidently say that association is not found in this data set. Um, so in the fully adjusted models, even the national inequality uh, is largely insignificant. And what does persist in every specification of the models that we've run is that uh, increased inequality at the village level is associated with lower child mortality after correcting for, um, for overall wealth. Uh, so it could be that this is that like some mechanism here makes sense perhaps so you might imagine that in um, small rural villages that have the same absolute wealth that the less equal villages have one or two highly wealthy people who might be politically influential and might be able to recruit health system resources for example or maybe there's a totally different relationship that's driving it and I, I certainly am like curious to hear people's thoughts um, but that's where the analysis stands now um, and I want to thank so much uh, Dr. Mendavid David and Dr. Basu for advising on this. Thank you, Daniel. I think one of the things you've done is actually spoken directly to our keynote, Diana Chapman Walsh's um, request that we look hard and deep at data. And sometimes that's going to present <coughs> surprising conclusions to us. So uh, I thought this was a, a really nice, provocative discussion. And I'm interested um, to hear questions from the audience. Hi, that was great. Thanks a lot. Um, could you revisit the slide from your, your final data slide that you had? I'm trying. Uh, Maybe. <laughs> They're working on it. OK. Well, what my question about it is, is that if you look at that data slide, it looks a lot like a lot of ecological data that we see all the time, where sort of the bottom triangle of the data is filled up. And in particular, the vast majority of data points fall at the low mortality risk, low inequality side of the graph. And so could, if you think about the distribution of the data, could it be possible that the data that are out on the right tail are just a sampling of the distribution toward the left tail, if that makes sense? Um, and have you thought about any ways to deal with that potential artifact? Yeah. Um... I'm not sure I'm totally fine, so I'm curious to hear more. Uh, definitely, well, I don't know, maybe you can flesh that out more, explain a bit more what you mean. Yeah, yeah. so, um, like, if you look on the left side of the mm -hmm. graph, you see a lot more data points. Um, and then as you move right, you see fewer and fewer data points, or at least that's what it appears. I know it's hard to visualize four mm -hmm. million data points. So if it's true that there are a lot more data points on the left side than the right side, is there a way to control for the fact that you're simply sampling more points for each level of wealth inequality, which gives you an opportunity to sample further into the tail towards the higher level of mortality risk, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Certainly, like, the results persist if you stratify by like, just including the top third of wealthiest households and middle third and lowest mm -hmm. third. Um, same for relative wealth, but... I don't know, if you have ideas, I'm interested. <laughs> I was hoping you would have some ideas, because I have a lot of data like this from yeah. completely different ecological studies that um, it's a kind of pattern that I keep seeing in data. So if anyone yeah. has ideas about how to deal with that. For example, something like possibly bootstrapping and only looking at subsets of the data that make the bin sizes more equal or something yeah. like that. Um, but it's a really interesting counterintuitive result. explanations. There's actually uh, two anecdotal things that this makes total sense to me. If, if uh, from my being in Tanzania, if you had uh, a village of 300 people and each one got distributed one dollar for their health, or you combine that $300 into one person, you'd have a much more effective intervention. So, I, so that, it just shows that if you completely distribute things equally, the second reason why it makes sense is that uh, in a village where everybody's equal, you don't have somebody who's sort of in charge. It's, uh, so it's from a paternalistic standpoint, if you're at a small enough level, you have basically the father or the village leader or something like that who actually can uh, make health interventions. So it makes sense that you would have that at a small level, but it would, that it would reverse at some point as you get larger mm -hmm. where those, those effects would disappear. Yeah, and that's definitely something I'd be interested in like exploring more how that actually happens. So if you have wealth concentrated in like a small number of village members who are influential, uh, to what extent are they actually like recruiting the health system there? Or how does that effect on mortality actually happen if it is causal? 
Um, so another data point that might be interesting to look at is your percent immunization, which you can probably get under DHS mm -hmm. demographic data, because under five mortality often reflects percentage immunized. Did you look at that to see if that changed no, your yeah, distribution? Yeah, yeah. There's obviously in 63 countries over 25 years so much going on, both like in time trends and just cross-sectional associations, and I think it would be interesting to maybe more at like the individual uh, country level drill down on that. I wonder to what extent that data exists longitudinally for all births, though. Yeah. yeah.